enliven and, and revive participation, particularly among communities that are not engaged. So um, we're just, you know, we have to have a lot of conversations, both I think with people who have been participating and, and um, what they think of it, people who haven't been participating, members of the public, and also have to have those same conversations inside the administration. We have our um, second meeting of the Participatory Budgeting Advisory Committee tomorrow, actually. And we'll be talking with them about, um, he's starting to talk about what a citywide participatory budgeting could look like. And some of the things we're thinking about and we'll be discussing with them is just, um, you know, there are different ways to define what citywide means, right? And we know that there are council districts that are have not been participating and before we were talking about the importance of going to those spaces where they haven't seen a participatory budgeting program from their council, uh, from the council level. Um, so we're thinking, how do you define what citywide is? Um, so we're looking to offer people the opportunity to propose projects that would be beyond their council districts as a possibility, for instance, like a citywide project or a borough-wide project could be one way to define what citywide means if we had the opportunity to propose projects in every borough, for example. We're also looking at possibly adding a thematic focus um, to try to generate solutions to critical issues we're all grappling with in New York, such as resiliency or environmental justice. There could be other issues. And with all of these things really welcome, you're, you know, Definitely welcome everyone's thoughts um, on this. And um, I have to also just say that I have a cough, which seems to be acting up when I speak. So hopefully I will not break out into a cough during this part where I'm speaking. Um, but if that does, I just have to stop for a minute. Um, OK. So um, also thinking about ways of including specific marginalized and underrepresented communities. Thank you very much. What flavor is this, by the way? Is it lemon mint? Okay, just, yeah, I noticed, like, I have this, and it has menthol, or they all have menthol, but anyway, that makes my cough worse. Oh. <laughs> but thank you. Okay. I like the, if it's the lemon, it doesn't Yeah, I mean, if it is, I'm going to have a little bit of it. Um, so, uh, in the charter, there are specific subgroups that have been named that we should be thinking about, and these include um, seniors, veterans, youth, people with disabilities, um, language communities, and so we're looking to work, uh, we are starting conversations with these agencies that work with these communities, and we had started talking about the listening tours, as you recall, we haven't implemented yet. Um, and our latest iteration of it, Eve had had her class um, work on a proposal for us where um, they developed um, a, a format for us to do listening session with youth. So that's a possible format. Um, and the other thing we've been exploring is trying to do listening sessions with some of these specific populations. So in the conversations we've been having with agencies, they've been telling us, for instance, um, that they already have groups, um, you know, like advisory groups that convene. So we've been trying to connect with those spaces. Just this week, we went to the Civic Engagement um, com Committee of the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities. And Jose is actually on that committee as well. So, um, you know, that's an existing body. So trying to go there, talk about our work, get their feedback on our programs. Um, and they were very engaged both on the issue of community boards, talking a lot about how it's very hard for people with disabilities to access CD meetings for various reasons. So um, we'll go back to have more conversations about that and then also talk about participatory budgeting. Um, and then also thinking about how we just work better with city agencies, um, different community-based partners um, to tackle the problem, you know, and any number of thematic issues that we might come up with. Does anyone have questions about anything I said so far on PD or comedy? I do. Yeah. Um, what has been done to, um, right now the problem with PD is 
believe that it's voluntary on each council member. Yeah. So what's been done uh, as far as we should be reaching out to the speaker um, and, and really, and, and his colleagues, and whether to address the council directly or the council members to uh, either try to make them make this mandatory, it's not a big budget, it's a few million dollars off their budget, that, that, that they're gonna go ahead with this because as much as we can come up with ideas, if the councilman doesn't implement it within his district, it's on deaf ears. Yeah, that's you're really raising a really important um, point. There are council members who are not voluntary, voluntarily participating, and I think that idea of the, well, the council process is a voluntary process. Correct. And I think that's why during the Charter Revision Commission and, and the creation of the Civic Engagement Commission, people saw the CEC as a vehicle to create a mandatory citywide program because this allocation that the administration will make to this program is separate from the council members voluntary participation. So we will have an, a separate allocation to work with in what the council members are doing uh, out of their own discretionary funds, if that makes sense. No, uh -huh. what, do you, what do you mean we, we won't have funds? Civic Engagement Commission, yes. We, we will have a pot of money to exactly. give to each council member? No, um, not to give to each council member, to create a citywide participatory budgeting program in which every New Yorker will have the opportunity to participate. To participate, to, to recommend projects towards exactly. which budget, the general budget, the city budget? Yes, or? yes. So it's a different, it's a parallel process that will align with the council's process. It will not duplicate it. So the council members who are participating currently if they choose to continue, they will continue. The ones who are not participating, if they want to continue, they might. Um, but we're running a, pro a process in addition to what's already been done. And I think that the idea behind it was because not all council members are doing it and nothing is mandating them to do it. Right. So, so there's nothing in the charter that says council must do it. But do we know why council members are not um, well, that's a very good question, and I think we're going to be exploring it more deeply, but the general understanding that I have is one very important reason is staff capacity. Right. Running the BB pro pro process is very staff intensive, takes a lot of community outreach and um, also just you know internal work, uh, staff work, so working with agencies, for example, on um, understanding how the projects that have been voted on are or and also developing and refining the project idea. So staff intensive um, commitment is one reason. Uh, the other reason could be just philosophically maybe not as interested. Are not typically involved, 
Yes, about a million dollars. About a million dollars for some are doing more, but for all the projects, some allocated to one only, others allocated to many smaller ones. And it would be great to know the citywide amount because to me, it seems like a lot of work to go for a very small pot of money. And for some of these organizations that are not so big, do not have such a huge budget, it will be a lot of work to put proposals together. And it's like, I don't know, for us to do a citywide big program and utilize our staff to do all that work and to fight for another million dollars to a project yeah. that I, I, I just want to think this through a little bit more when we get the amount. Yeah. To see if, if it's even worth putting all the energy and effort towards something that maybe we should just, I don't know. I mean, I said just like clarification. Can I just understand, is the, this bucket of money that we have, uh -huh. it is only for citywide Initi initiatives? No, we have to define, the charter asks us to do citywide participatory budget. We have to define what that means. Right, but that, that say, means Citywide participation. I think that's what the, the participation. I, yes, but it yes. doesn't mean that it has to be citywide because I, I'll agree. I mean, more. most of these organizations do not do citywide programming, oh, right. yeah. so it's not yeah. scalable. So I, I, I you know, I, then I'm w wondering. Wait a minute. Is this then agencies of City of New York that we're deciding on their bud? Like some. You know, outside yeah. line to their budget, and then how does that work? So, to your so, point, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. Can I weigh in? Yeah, please. Go for it. Um, I'm sorry. Can I weigh in? I think that the Pretty much the youth groups come out for this. Right. 
the schools, the sports clubs, people of that kind of nature, and they'll say, let's put the uh, upgrade the electrical system, let's put in this uh, air conditioning in the school, uh, let's fix this field, things of that nature where they can rally a body of people. It's not just like, you know, uh, just the neighborhood. It's a group of people with a common interest that will come out for that particular thing. Yeah. So as you were saying, it's very difficult then to scale that borough-wide and scale it city-wide because there'll be such a diverse um, uh, outlook on what people want to do. So that's going to be another challenge you're going to have to look at. Yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely be. And, and I can reach out to you all, you know, off oh, on email and see who's interested if you'd like to. Yeah, and I think the big key is to find out what kind of budget you're talking about yeah, because yeah. that's going to make so much more of a difference. We're talking a five million dollar budget citywide, and it's it's, it's moving. And know. also, is it for capital? I mean, you're, it's not here. I mean, he he brings this up all the time. Right. Is it, is it capital or is it programming? And that's very different. Though. Yeah, we've we've been asking for a, some some combination of both to not leave it exclusively to capital. So we'll if I'm not see. mistaken, right now they do both. Some, they do both no. capital and improve, like they'll do an upgrade to the electrical system for school, but they can't put air conditioning because the, uh, the electrical is 50 years old. So that will be a capital improvement. No, I, I think it's all capital. All it? council members are only doing capital, capital. processes. That's, yeah. That's very difficult for them. So it. except for a small amount of profit that that puts it in, you can, right. the, it would pay the rent for a small amount of profit. That's one of the things you can in, but it, it can't go towards the program, towards staffing, staffing, or even you know, like getting someone in to run a program, especially on that night. Okay, okay. Um, I'm going to keep this moving, so we will continue. Um, yes, yeah, um, follow up with you all on that. Um, and okay, the next area I wanted to provide a quick update on is the community boards. I don't know if folks saw, I, I sent around an email that shared some articles where the commission was cited. Um, so I think there's an increasing interest out there now in just, you know, improving representation at community boards and make, helping them connect better with the communities um, in which they are located. Um, we've been talking with every, we're trying to reach every borough president's office and discuss this, the trainings that they're providing to community boards. We've talked to everyone except Queens. We're scheduling that one. Um, we did a convening um, of Queens community boards. Um, we did a convening of Bronx community boards and had a group of you know, district managers and chairs with us. We're also starting to do one-on-one. Um, as I mentioned, we had a conversation with the MOPT um, about barriers to uh, people with disabilities joining their community boards. Um, we're also doing an online and written survey with community boards, so that's 20 out of 59 have filled that out, so we'll be continuing to build that number. Um, and just really starting to get out there to community board districts or cabinet meetings. Um, and uh, as I said, doing a lot of one-on-ones. Um, some of the community boards we've met with so far, Manhattan, um, 2, 3, 12, 11, 7, 1, Queens. We've met with one, which is community board 4, Brooklyn 3. So we're just going to continue to go out there and try to put CEC on their radar. Um, and then, so just, can you just highlight like, the top issue that they're bringing up with? Um, I think it's a little soon to tell. Um, we've been uh, trying to get their input on the areas that we have been asked to work in. So like land use, like, you know, planning, um, whether they need support around language access, and whether, um, uh, sorry, technical assistance. So. I think it's it's too soon to tell. I think a lot of you know there, it's been interesting. Um, we talked also a little bit about you know recruitment and yeah. I don't know, it's it's I don't I, it's it's hard to say general. I, I'd just like to jump in, and I know a number of commissioners also serve on the community board. Yeah. So forgive me for saying this, but um, 
one thing that I do know from many of my community members is that there is a closed community. It's a, cl it's a closed club, some of these community boards. Mm -hmm. yep. And it was cited in a number of the articles, too, where people tried to get in and they were kind bullied of shut out, out or bullied out. So while you're talking to the community boards, it's great, but I heard a lot of internal talking to the community boards. There's a lot of self-interest in these community boards. And so if we want to change what is occurring there, I think we need to get some input from outside of the community boards to talk about recruitment because while there might be complaints on the inside that they're not getting recruits, I'm also hearing that people come forward, get on, and resign because there is a hazing that happens. Yeah, so by outside you mean the public. Yeah, well, and, and also not I would yeah. also say seek, seek out some of these people who are on and resign quickly or mm -hmm. resign within a certain period and start to ask them why. You know, some may be for personal reasons, but I think you might also find, especially in land use, I know that there's a certain language within land use, and so the CBs tend to not bring on newbies because they don't speak that language. And it's a very confusing process to learn. And so, language, you know, knowledge is used as a way to exclude. And they exclude community members because of this language use as well. So, um, hot off the press, I just went to both council members in our district, and you can count on one hand, and you don't need all five fingers, the new people that applied and the applications that do try. And how well are they doing with outreach? So the outreach is out there as far as they've been put out there with our president. Emails have gone out. Um, we have empty seats. We might potentially have an empty seat on the board. The point is that if there's such a clamor, it's not following through when it's time to do it. We found also that a lot of times, and, and, and I'm not going to completely uh, disregard what you're saying, that potential may be there. A lot of people have a, an impression of what they think the board is, any organization. You, you join a nonprofit, you join a school board, whatever it might be, and they get there and they thought. And remember, it's a volunteer spot. It is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. A lot of people go there for the honorarium. Mm -hmm. And once they get there, they realize that the honorarium versus the amount of work that they have to do is not just in balance with their own lives. And a lot of people sometimes hang around just to try to get through it. And those that are a little bit more quick to the, uh, uh, the chase will, will quit after a year or two. Uh, I've had just recently one or two people leave after a year. And I asked them, so you know, you're supposed to come to the meeting. Oh. <laughs> really, I, I, honestly, and a very active person, a, a terrific lady involved in the school system and, and the school board, but she didn't realize that she had to go to monthly meetings and be involved. So she dropped out. Uh, we have other people Do they that, get, like, briefings or, like... I think that that's part of what we're trying to talk uh, <coughs> with people about as we're, you know, what kinds of trainings and orientations yeah, are you getting? Like, do you have a, you know... Well, so, Queens, the borough president and city planning commission do uh, outreach. They do twice a year. Yeah, just one sec. Let uh, Chuck finish, and then I'll let, yeah let you. In, in Queens, the borough president definitely has training through the uh, director of community boards as far as parliamentary procedure, as far as the charter, as far as city policy, budget. Those are the big important things. And then city planning does land use, mm -hmm. and we recently have they do it annually now. They've been doing it annually do a two day session. And basically, it's, it's a one-on-one to get to the nomenclature that, you know, most people don't know. And then they try to do the next day a little bit more of a, a 201 to get a little bit more in depth. Because you it, it is very correct. It's a very technical uh, process, and a lot of people don't get it. Some do. And, and it's a difficult one to get on a once-a-month type of basis, on a volunteer basis. Mm -hmm. If your mindset goes to that, that's terrific. If your mindset doesn't, it becomes overwhelming and frustrating. However, that's where leadership comes in on the community boards, where they can provide conversation and explanation in simple terms. Or if someone raises their hand, I don't quite understand this. And then at the end, your, your committee made a recommendation. If you're really not quite sure which way to go, 
we suggest you follow your committee's recommendation, because that was the purpose of the committee, to get through all the, the minutiae and come up with a solution. And if not, you could always vote against the committee also, but it was a guidepost that we provide. Still, it's a pretty technical, non-paying job that becomes voluminous when you think they have to meet once a month for board meetings and possibly two, three, four times a month for different committee meetings. And then at the end they say, I have other things in my life, not for me. And that's okay, we understand that, because not every organization is for every person. You know, the person on the school board may not want to be on the committee board. The committee board may not want to be on the school board. They may not want to be on the advisory board. You know, everybody has what, you know, excites them and where their passion is and how they want to volunteer. So that's what we've been finding out. But the borough president does have outreach, and they do have um, uh, the city, uh, Department of City Planning in Queens does have two annual meetings to make outreach to community board members. And it's open to everybody, not just to the newbies. It's good to have, you know, the experienced land use chairs all the way down to the person who's just walking in for the first time, because that kind of gives you a uh, into flow of dialogue. Annette, did you have a comment? Yeah, no, I, yeah, so, um, I just wanted to talk about the issue of outreach. You know, I'm pretty involved with this um, person in my community on um, all sorts of, you know, mailing lists. And I have to say, I think, I think we, it's failing to constituents in terms of outreach. I appreciate all the comments around, you know, what a challenging um, uh, role this might be. But I think we we have to have the first step, which is getting the word out to your everyday person who is not involved, who should be involved, um, that this is an opportunity. And then let them decide, right? But I think we, 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 we are far from um, achieving that first objective, that this opportunity is made available to, to the most underrepresented people. On, on. That, that's interesting. How do you think the best outreach can be done that's different from what's being done now? Because I agree with you. I'm extremely active for the Manhattan and the Bronx. And I'm on mailing list, but they're not really expanding outside of the inner circle individuals like myself. Um, do we have dollars? Yeah, do we have dollars to like publicize in local newspapers or public access TV? Is there a major effort really happening in the president's offices to really get the non-politicized individuals to be active? Because I have to be honest, it's not a very attractive body to be part of <laughs> when you walk in and it's a bunch of clicks. Yeah. I myself will never, and I will, I'm saying this publicly, and I know it's terrible, but why would I want to start on a board where you already control the number of votes to get things through? There are communities that are almost like plan to be left out, all the way from immigrant communities to communities that have language access issues, communities that want to bring in new businesses. I mean, you should witness some of the stuff that goes on. And I partic particularly, I can cite, you know, like the Riverdale Community Board, Community Board 8, where there are articles historically being written about racial issues, you know, not allowing certain new communities to participate. And a lot of it has been charged to politics. So I'm not saying that um, all of these issues that are fixed, all I'm saying is we have to begin to clear some of the issues internally first, but also hold our feet to the fire. What are they really doing to email or you know outreach outside of their very comfortable in a circle of e that they send every week and every month? Well, it goes back to the borough president appoints and the council member recommends. That's why it's blue. And, and it, it, it is in that sense, but I think the basic outreach has to come from them. Uh, unless we have another mechanism, and I'm, and I'm open to that, but it, it's very difficult. And we've made an announcement to community boards. They say, by the way, you know, your applications are due. If you have new members, we'll make the announcement. But that doesn't mean people will come forward. So yeah, what, are you talking, what are we talking to? The same people that are applying every year? I know friends of mine that have been serving in community boards for over 30 years. That's shameful. I cannot Excuse wait. Me. I'm telling you. Excuse me. I don't know. I think that's shameful. No, I, I think communities change in a city like the city of New York every four or five years. What's the effort? I'm not saying if you want to serve, serve because you have a set of experience, but 
What are we doing to bring in, bring in these new communities that are living, paying taxes, opening up business, have different sets of needs, etc. I don't see the change in the faces when I visit these community boards. That is, I don't so, know. Uh, so what we are charged with doing as a commission yeah, is okay. to improve the connection between community boards and communities, right? And it is by providing primarily additional resources to what CBs have. So for instance, um, and also I think what we're really charged with doing is increasing the public civic engagement broadly. So raising their awareness that community boards are an avenue to connect with, right? And if there are this language diversity within a community, the community board can perhaps do, you know, make more effort to reach the language community. So that's a resource we'd be providing, um, you know, helping think through better online um, communication. So again, these are all things we're, we're just trying right now to get an understanding and a lay of the land to see what community boards are doing, not doing, what resources they already have, because we want to add value. We don't want to duplicate things that are already done. Right, although I do want to put in here that I think we really need a change management specialist, because you're talking about changing culture, and that is much more than just you know, giving money uh, for resources. Mm -hmm. It really is, this is a cultural shift, and I think, you know, both Chuck speaks of it in one way, and William in another, um, and my myself, was, you know, was, my myself is redundant, but, and, and I've also pointed out, I think you have a culture within these CBs, and if there is going to be change, you need a specialist who understands how to look at a culture, and see where you want to take it and how to move you to, to where you want to go. I don't think it's simply putting resources in. Well, I really don't. I think it, it's like throwing, have, I think it's throwing money out the window, quite frankly. Good. I just want to make a point on that, too. It's, um, I don't think that we could add resources. Sorry, Eve is talking. Sorry, uh, Annetta. Sorry. Um, I, I think it's important not to add resources to community boards for land use planning and other things until we have a pretty good indication that there is a willingness to be more representative. That's right. You know, and I think we to, to get that to get to that endpoint, we have to leverage inside and we have to leverage outside. Yeah. And you know, um, I, I I think that the you know kind of like public service announcement aspect to notifying people that you know community boards are open for membership has been lacking. You know, and I'm not pointing a finger at any borough or any any mayor or anything, I think it's historic. Yes, there, yeah. mm -hmm. there has not been a sufficient process um, to open up participation. But, you know, and I also think that if, if, if we are engaged in something like that as the engagement commission, then um, there really needs to be a better job like getting people to understand like why it matters to their right. daily mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and there are really important decisions that are being mm -hmm. made in community boards that impact people's ability to stay in their neighborhoods yeah. and, you know, we <coughs> to help get impacted people into the woods. And it's not to say that we throw out the baby with the bathwater. I think, I think, you know, the points that you've made about the expertise on land use, you know, we need that expertise, you know, because they are complex issues, but we need to balance it. Yeah. We also need those that are being affected by the decisions of that particular community. Absolutely. Community. The average mom, the average students, the average, like when you're making a land use um, a recommendation resolution to vote on a project, those affected to be, to be, uh, to have a seat at the table. It just dawned on me what was sad was that when the borough president had to hear, uh, the open land use committee meetings and the budget, in other words, all the training, less than 20% of the boards were there. Yeah. So those are the existing board members. And those are the ones that even in the meeting said we need more training, we need more. And those people that even cried for more training didn't show up for meetings. Yeah, so, so it's very it's, frustrating. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Even when access is available, okay. it's frustrating that even those within the process don't take advantage of it. So we're, we're going to have to look into sort of different formats, right? How to make these trainings more accessible. Um, it's 11.47, so I'm going to shift us a little bit again to get into the poll site stuff. Um, just to give you a quick overview, we've been working with, continuing to meet with the Mayor's Office of Operations and um, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs 
to talk about logistics of transitioning over this program to CEC. We have a special election coming up in March in Queens for our president, the presidential primary in April 28th, um, the state primary June 23rd, and then we are responsible for fully running um, the November 3, November 3rd elections. So over the course of the next couple of months, we'll be gradually transitioning to CEC. Um, as far as the Language Access Advisory Committee, we had our first meeting and we shared with them the proposed methodology. We're really trying to encourage members of the committee and their, the CBOs they work with and, and who, you know, just people to come out and speak in the public hearing and that's, we should think about that, about how to do that more as a commission as well. Um, which I think media outlets to publicize um, the methodology and to get more public input. Uh, and then also have translated um, the executive summary of the proposed methodology in all of the languages that we are going to be providing or hoping to provide services in. Um, so I um, want to ask you your thoughts about that and, and we're going to do the presentation and have a conversation about it, but it would be great to really get your input on how we can do better outreach um, to get people more engaged in the public hearing, because it is our first public hearing. So it'd be nice to have, as a civic engagement commission, people civically engaged in this mm -hmm. program. Um, and then really quickly, I'm gonna send, um, we've been also talking internally about creating some kind of online portal for civic engagement and looking to, I don't know if I mentioned it before, but hoping to launch a digital innovation competition that would allow people to compete on you know, ways to create this kind of platform. Um, and then in early April, I'm gonna be participating and hopefully with others, if anyone wants to join this workshop, let me know. Um, at Columbia um, in, this, in the School of International Public Affairs, as well as there's a program called the World Projects Program. We'll be doing a workshop that brings together um, government people, philanthropy, academics, um, to talk about ways to strengthen digital engagement. So I can send you the information about that as well. Um, so next, um, I want to turn to the poll site methodology because we said we'd spend a bunch of time talking about that. Um, today we have with us um, various members of the administration who are, have been working really hard on the Pulsite language assistance pilot and the methodology. Uh, with us today we have Peter Lobo, who's the Deputy Director of the Population Division at the Department of City Planning. Um, colleagues who you saw last time uh, from the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, Sabrina Fong, the Deputy Director of Research, Anne Montesano, the Executive Director of Interagency Initiatives and Language Access. Also here with us is Asher Ross, Data Director of the Mayor's Office, uh, Mayor's Immigrant, sorry, Mayor's Community Affairs Unit. Um, as I mentioned last time, both Sabrina and Asher have been really helpful in the data analysis, and Doug and uh, Fuller from the Civic Engagement Commission. Um, we're going to take you through a PowerPoint that provides an overview, a deeper, like, just talking more slowly about the methodology that we were able to do last time. We're inviting your questions and feedback. Um, is Carol Garza here yet? Okay. All right, this will, if she doesn't come, um, we'll have a, little, we'll have a little, little more time to talk about the methodology. Um, before we go to that, since we now have a forum, <laughs> we can go to the minutes. Um, so the minutes should be in front of you. Um, and if you recall, um, last time we had spent a bunch of time talking about two amendments um, to, um, that related to our ability to publish the methodology. So Amendment 1, delegated responsibility and authority to the chair to publish proposed methodology and also um, to ratify past recruitment and appointment to the advisory boards. Amendment 2, permanently de delegated responsibility and authority to the chair of the commission to recruit and appoint members to the advisory board. So both of those were passed 
um, last time. So I just want to ask, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes presented? Just one question. Yes. We had uh, voted on Amendment 1 to give you the authority to publish the methodology in order to meet a deadline. Yes. Was that deadline met? Yes. It was. Yes. Yeah.
and the data sets that the commission is using or used for um, the proposed methodology that was published on Janu January 1st, 2020 um, is the American Community Survey 2017 one-year estimate. The American Community Survey um, five-year estimates, which is the only track level um, estimates we have. And the final methodology, which is to be published April 1st, 2020, will use only the most recent five-year data that was not yet available when the proposed methodology was published. And last time we talked about comparing um, data sets to see what um, I'm going to invite my colleague from Moya, Sabrina, to talk us through the slide and some of the data sets that were raised in the last commission meeting. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, to Gagan's point, I think the last time we had <coughs> briefly discussed the methodology at the last meeting, there were a lot of questions about why are we using the census data? Is there a better data set that we should be using? So we just wanted to take some time to talk through um, why we went with that. Um, and then also some detail, but, and then also to address the other two data sets that folks have brought up. Um, so basically for our purposes, we're looking for a data set that would provide information about US citizen New Yorkers, age 18 and over, who have limited English proficiency, um, and where they reside, basically, right? And again, that goal is really just to assess what is the uh, language needs of voters in New York City, so that we can then best determine how to target our services for the Pulse Interpretation Project. Um, and so I'll just kind of go through each. Um, the first one is the U.S. Census American Community Survey. Uh, the American Community Survey is a, a national survey that the U.S. Uh, Census Bureau administers every year to about 3.5 million households. It's really the largest survey done every year. Um, and it's designed to provide reliable estimates um, in small areas and on some, around small populations, um, covering over 35 topics, including, for our purposes, U.S. citizenship, age, um, limited English proficiency, language spoken at home, and, and language spoken at home, among others. Um, and very quickly, they define limited English proficient as if you speak a language other than English at home, and that you've answered the survey that you speak English less than very well. Um, and so, basically, um, and, and the American Community Survey makes this data available at the individual response level. So we're, and so that is able to serve as the foundation for our methodology because it provides almost every single data point that we need to determine need, which is age, citizenship status, um, and English proficiency and language. Um, and, and the next data set that, we, that we're going to use is the voter rolls from the Board of Elections um, and couple that with a voter a surname analysis of those. Um, so basically the voter rolls is just a list of every single registered voter in New York City. Um, but the surname analysis will use an individual's last name to determine basically the likelihood that that individual uh, belongs to a certain ethnic or racial group and then that then serves as a proxy for what language that person may speak. Um, and of course because the census data does not have information on who's actually registered to vote, the goal here is to couple it with the surname analysis of those registered to vote, um, which would then help refine or kind of like check our estimates of need around every poll site. Um, so that, those two data sets are really gonna be the foundations for our methodology. And then very quickly, just taking a few seconds in detail, two other um, data sets that folks had mentioned from the commission last time, um, and just maybe talk through why we're not using them. Um, the first was um, the Department of Education Parent Survey. That's a survey done every year to every to New York City parents who have a student enrolled in any public school um, from the sixth to twelfth grade. Um, and basically, while that survey asks information about language preference. It doesn't provide us any other data point that's useful here in terms of citizenship status, whether they're registered to vote, or if they're even limited English proficient. And the universe is only parents of, you know, select parents of students enrolled in 6th to 12th grade in public schools, so it's also not representative of what the entire need may be in the city. Um, and then the last um, data set that folks mentioned was the IDMIC cardholder data. So that would be administrative data about um, every single New Yorker in, um, with an IDNYC card, which would be any 
New Yorker age 10 and up who have, a, who have an IDNYC card. Um, and that also, similar to, to the, the DOE survey, while that has information on language preference, it does not provide us any other information about citizenship status, whether they're registered to vote, whether they're limited English proficient. Um, and, and again, it's only those who have a card, so that's also not the entire universe or representative of New York City, whereas the census data is truly weighted to be representative of um, the entire city. Okay. Pause for questions. Are there questions um, or comments on anything that's been presented so far? I, I just wanted from column one, mm -hmm. column three, column four. All get sorted through column two? Uh, I'm not sure. I, uh, what do you mean sorted by? Well, in other words, you, you've got your census, you got a, you got a, a group, and then you got some other people that are part of the Department of Education, parents, and mm -hmm. then you've got your IDC. Mm -hmm. IDC. I'm saying you pull that together, now you've got a master list. Not quite. Actually, our master list is truly the census that's like the broadest unit, and then within those, we look at uh, the study analysis help to refine take a look at those that are actually registered to vote. And then these two are not actually part of our uh, methodology. These are just meant to address uh, some of the questions because folks ask, why aren't we using? So what do you use? Though? So, OK, so let me go back. So you take the census list and you sort them through the voters, the actual voters. Um, so the census data will provide us who's eligible to vote. Correct. Um, and then, and it's not like these two can be directly linked, right? The census is an anonymized survey, so we don't know which individual has answered this survey exactly. And then this is administrative data who's actually registered to vote. We have anything that would appear in theory on a voter registration form, full name, address. And so we would, after using the census data to get at the concentrations of here are the poll sites with the broadest need, um, we would do a similar thing with the voter rolls where we um, do a surname analysis to say, now these are the poll sites based on this data set where the greatest number of language groups or communities are residing and you kind of check those against each other. That's my point, you're sorting yeah. against each other. So then once that is done, how are the last two columns used? The last two columns are not used. Oh. Um, I just wanted to uh, okay. walk through these because I know folks had asked why okay. aren't these. Yeah. So the first two columns are what work together. Correct. That's the important part. Okay, I'm clear. I just have one question on um, looking at surnames. I understand what you're doing. It makes me a little uncomfortable knowing that people are being s separated out by a surname. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how the universe of the government looks at these things, but it, it, it hits me as a little bit like, whoa, what's going on there? Yeah. And the ACLU and just how this information is being used, and also we live in a world where people marry other yeah. people and take other names. That's right. And so we're missing those people. And we're also, you know, there are, I guess, names where you can clearly say they're from this mm -hmm. region, but we don't know that with a lot of other names. So uh, it makes me slightly uncomfortable, and I just wanted to say that. I'll just note, surname so analysis is, is used by the New York City Board of Elections in their methodology to determine I think when coupled with the census data, they kind of make each other estimates more accurate um, because particularly if you're looking at, if the census data is telling you there's a certain um, enclave or cluster high, highly concentration language community, the surname can kind of help just confirm that. Um, but, but no, it And voter activation network ban does that already. So that's what, when you're desegregating, trying to target so that you're sending out language appropriate materials to individual voters, it doesn't, not always the best, but it does provide that option. Um, my question is about um, the ACS data and how it doesn't really encapsulate all of the diverse communities that we have in New York City <laughs> and looking at other ways potentially to look at like LEP data as like the prime focus of how we want to do language access within the city and the voting uh, population. So I know the ACS data is what you're using as your prime data source. Is there a different way that we can do it so that we're 
ensuring we're catching as many uh, folks as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Peter Lobo, and actually I work on the Board of Elections in Metropolitan. Um, Can you speak up, sir? My name is Peter Lobo, and I work with the Board of Elections on Metropolitan. <coughs> Excuse me. So the ACS data is actually the most representative data available. And it's available at really small geographies. There's nothing that comes close to it. It's, it's considered the gold standard in terms of surveys. So you know, in terms of ethnic groups, uh, if you aren't going to find them on the ACS, basically you aren't going to find them anywhere else. Because the sample size is so robust. Uh, the problem with the ACS data, if you don't want to call it that, and it gives us a lot of the stuff that we need, right? It tells us who's a certain, it gives us, gives, uh, gives us their age, tells us if they speak a language other than English at home, and tells us whether they're limited English proficient or not. What it does not have is whether this person is re uh, registered to vote or not. And the data are actually pretty accurate. We've uh, done samples, we've gone out in the field. Um, and, and this is across the nation. The, the data are pretty good at, uh, at a small area. Uh, especially when they're grouped to poll sites. Now we want to confirm, so, so we have the CD LED population, but we don't know whether they are registered. So we do a surname analysis to make sure that, for example, Chinese voters, there are Chinese voters present in, the, in these areas. And by the way, in terms of confidentiality, the point you raise, these are aggregate level data. So all it will tell us, for example, is there are 50 Chinese voters in this area, period, nothing else. And so we have a substantial number of, say, Chinese voters, and we've got a substantial number of Chinese CDLEP population, and we say, ah, oh, it makes sense to actually have that both side included. So it's basically one data set reinforcing the other. We want to make sure there's an adequate number in each. Can you drill down on some of the numbers? Because you said 3.5 million households nationally. Yes. That's 10% of the of the entire population, right? That's about 3% of all households. There's yeah. about a quarter of a million households in New York City each year. At the five-year data, basically have 1.25 million households. It's a pretty robust sample. So when you're also going back to like the voter data, that's only with the assumption of who's already registered to vote. Exactly, because that's the view one of the services to register voters, right? Yes, but then the, you're leaving out the population that can be registered. So from what I understand, this both side analysis is meant to help voters. Yeah, no, I mean, other there is, you're looking at voters in their current form. Like if you're looking at a snapshot in time of saying, we have two million voters registered today in New York City. Yes. And not thinking about the potential of the others who are coming down the road maybe younger folks, maybe people who are becoming new Americans, and I know that's harder to uh, estimate, but it's also another consideration. I think I hear that, and I think um, the methodology um, is what we're discussing today, but the analysis itself required by the law is that it is updated annually. So, you know, to the extent that that is being captured, and it should be in the voter rolls and in the census data, that those new languages will also be emerging based on this analysis when we were updating it every year. But we're forgetting one thing. New registrants can be put into the database. So when someone exactly. registers for this cycle, they will be represented. Right. That's so, right. So they won't be left out. It's just that if someone doesn't register, right. they'll be left out because they're not they're not. They'll be left out this year. Right. But hopefully yeah. they will be yes. Hopefully but every be. cycle new registrants can be included into this mix. That's exactly right. That's just, what's not said. Just as a reminder, we have to actually revise this methodology so by 2022. Um, and so every five years after that, it will be, so this will allow us to address some of the changing numbers. Can, can I make a slight recommendation too in, in companionship with this, uh, this methodology that um, we actually do a, a good job of publicizing that there's increased um, language access. Mm -hmm. Because I think, you know, to your point, where, I mean, you know, I think our, our mission is to um, capture more voters, to get more people to vote, you know, not exclusively vote, but participate through voting. Um, and I think, you know, the more that people understand that there are additional languages, 
that will help them connect to what's on the ballot. You know, the, the, the more that we will have, we'll have better data the next year. We have time to report that. Yeah, and I think even when we've had um, good outreach around language access, there are times where people thought just because it said language access and included their language, mm -hmm. and it didn't. Mm -hmm. So that also served as a confusion point in the process. But I'm going back to a couple, like two election cycles ago where um, even people who were coming in to the board to the poll site with their own translator, a family member, a friend, someone, and they were being turned away because they weren't allowing them to go into the poll site. So now if we're doing a poll site language access program, I would want to make sure that we're like being as intentional as possible and making sure that we are being as expansive as possible in this first run so that we can build it to be even better the next little round. What do you mean by expansive? To m make sure that we're not limiting it to, like I know that we have to do 100 full size, I think it is, or. Yeah. So ideally we can do 200 <laughs> and, <laughs> and be able to like push forward. Um, in a way where you know every vote counts in every election, and we've seen that happen time and again. Um, but making sure that we're being as expansive right now with the data as possible, because we're, I don't know why we even want to limit ourselves in providing language access. Yeah, um, I think the point you're making about, I think both of you sort of said it, just about making sure that people know their rights want to bring their own interpreters because I think we're, it's very, it's hard to imagine a universe in which every person who had a language barrier was served in New York City at the full site. I think we're always going to have a scenario of finite resources and a finite number of people served. And so anyone who isn't able to be served should know their right to bring in, you know, somebody to help them out. So I think, I think we just need to do a lot of it. One is knowing the right, but the other is enforcing it at the polls. Because yeah. you know you're right, so you bring someone, <coughs> but then you're turned away, which is not legally what is allowable. So it's enforcement as well as outreach. It's both. Yeah, the, the poll site, I mean, we talked about this before. Poll site uh, employees really need to get better training. I myself have witnessed uh, people um, asking for ID, turning people away. They try with me all the time, and then I pulled my rights. And but it's you know very um, it's a culture of change. A lot of this again, both side workers have been politically assigned to work the sites for decades, and it's just reminding them that communities have changed and they have rights, so they should be allowed to bring a translator, but also to just say their name and their address and post. Mm -hmm. Can I get clarification, Board of, Educa uh, Board of Elections? <clears throat> Am I allowed any individual to bring a personal translator into the poll site and vote, or must I use someone to provide by BOE? I can just clarify, I think the problem is in your mind. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. So can anybody answer that? I thing? can yes. answer that. Yes. 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 You are allowed. You are allowed. You are. Yes. Okay. Thank you. But as long as the person is not like a union. Uh, uh, or a campaign work. Right. What you're not allowed to do is to bring to to a, to if you're a city BOE employee for that's all site, you're not supposed to allow anyone electioneering or telling someone how to vote. But if that even if you happen to know someone who's working at all site there, and the, and you have agreed to allow this person to come in and help you, that's okay as long as someone else is not witnessing electioneering. You can be challenged as a voter and not allowed to vote if you are engaging in electioneering um, in this poll site. Thank you. So the, the, the one thing that I wanted to add to this, this I, um, I want to look back to the, the surname issue, and I guess it, I'll try to do it with a question, which is, uh, because my name is Diller, so someone would, from a surname, start talking to me in German when in fact my family's heritage is quite mobby, but not really not much German at all. Um, and so I would be concerned if it wasn't, if, if that were used in an excluding capacity to 
remove a potential resource, but I would not be concerned if it were one more factor that buttressed the inclusion of a, um, of a language access. Um, and so I guess, I, I guess the question I would ask is, has any dry run been done on a data sample to see what the effect of the surname, the, the, in particular the surname coding would have on the selection of languages and does it simply change the order or ranking of one language versus another among the 12 that we were given or does it actually result in the dropping of Urdu and the picking up of Esperanto or whatever they are? Uh, the CVLP numbers from the ACA is actually drive the analysis. Mm -hmm. That's the, the primary driver. What what the surname analysis does is, you know, if it's with the Board of Elections there, it's, you know, are there enough people registered to vote as well? Uh, so it, it's not so much the surname analysis that's driving it, it's the ACS data, which I believe will pass to this moment. Right, to the extent that you are using the, sur the surname code, uh, it's there for a reason, and it, and it has a potential effect. I don't want to go crazy about the potential if the net effect is simply to tell us things that we already know and reinforce conclusions already made. But I would be concerned if surnames could, uh, surnames alone, and the inclusion of surnames in the overall data analysis bump the language off of our list that would otherwise be a part of it based on that one factor alone. It doesn't sound like it, but I want, I'm want i asking for confirmation that that's where this one. Um, and maybe it's, I think we've actually yet to go into what the methodology is, um, but the reason why that won't bump languages is because the surnames are not meant to use to select the languages, but actually to help target the poll site locations. The number of languages that we're providing interpretation is set by the, the designated citywide languages and the census data. Right, but it's the right. same question. Right. Right. It's the same question. Whether, whether a poll site is on or off a list for Polish, um, if, if my friend Michael Januszewski's name uh, appears to be a Polish name, then um, does that, and there are finite resources, does that by itself add or subtract a language availability at that poll site? It's the same Mike, analysis. Mark, to answer your initial question, we have not done a dry run of this. Okay. So we don't know how, what it looks like, right? And I think for when the BOE does it, it's basically used in a sort of confirming what the ACS data is showing. I, I imagine it hasn't, I don't know, has it ever knocked a multi off the list? I don't know. Yeah, there is a possibility that this is a known unknown. Yeah. For example, the, the last name Martin is Martin in Spanish. So there are a number of issues actually, but this is the world we face. So I would be much more comfortable with the process that uses surnames as a double check to raise questions that can then be answered by different data analysis than one that could give surnames by themselves the power to include or exclude a language availability. Um, because when we're, and then to go back to the, the discussion of mission, which is really good to refocus on, um, the mission is to promote more participation and this is, in effect, trying this language availability, as I understand it, is trying to accomplish two goals. One is to facilitate participation by those who already know that this exists and to make sure that they have the access to the poll. But the other is, hopefully, that by virtue of more participation in the, com uh, the community of people, people who are now feeling empowered, that they will bring others to register, they will bring others to vote with them. And so this is a non-trivial point about making sure that we're being that everything we do is is aimed at that inclusion as opposed to yes. a potential exclusion. That's where that's why I'm harping on this. This speaks to the issue of using multiple sources of data. Mm -hmm. So the poll sites, and once they're selected, that's just an initial selection. Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing you do is after an election, actually go take a look and see whether the you know these services were actually used. Yes. You know, so, so you get some corroborating evidence. You talk to community groups. And so you, you bring all that together so not one piece of information actually dominates in terms of the decision making process. Thank you.
Okay, we're going to take one more question and then move to the next slide. So to that point, I raised this before. I'm fully bilingual. I do not need translation services. How are we capturing, and I know we're using surnames, but we also are going into second and third generation of immigrant booming in the early 90s. Those folks do not need it when they have the names. Are we wasting our money in the wrong places? And I've never been asked, when I walk into a call site, I'm fully waiting over last name is Perez, to check anywhere, and I don't know if they just assume by me not asking for the services that I don't need it. Yeah. So how do we capture that? Yeah. So that is captured in the American Community Survey. Okay. So the, the survey asks, what language do you speak at home? If you say English or Spanish, that's one thing. If you say Spanish, they say, how well do you speak English? If you say you speak English very well, we do not include it. We would include you only if you were in an English profession. Okay, get it. So you're definitely 100% only using uh, the, the ACS analysis. Is there any way or any desire to do capture this, since we already have examples that are sitting there most of the times, we're not doing much all day, to capture those voters, to engage with those voters that are coming in uh, and getting the services. It's not so much the ones that just want to go about just voting and getting out because they speak English, mm -hmm. but the ones that do, do, do require the additional assistance. Do we check off that, you know, an expo site, 500 people did require Russian translation. Are we doing that wrong? Why do you want to speak to yeah. how the city has done this? Hi, I'm Elsa Sano with Moya. So in Moya's pilot program, um, the interpreters that the city hires through its vendor uh, absolutely does track the number of voters served. And our understanding, defer to BOE for, for their process, but our understanding is that they also are tracking um, service utilization. Um, so the voters who are utilizing their interpretation services. I'm interested in comparing the analysis once we have a, this proposal with that list to see if it makes sense, to see if we're serving the communities that need it the most. Because I'm all about, you know, like talking about using the resources where they're most needed. And the assumption that because the Bronx is the largest Latino populated borough, um, we put a whole bunch of, you know, Spanish translators there, but then again, there's a growing African community. Are we serving them? Because they, they are newer and they need more um, the services. So I just would like to see the usage versus data, um, uh, the surname based data, whatever, to see if really we should say, instead of continuing to put a whole bunch of Spanish translators in the Bronx, can we specifically go after those that really need really, really. I don't. I don't know if the. I don't know. I just. I don't know if the Moya program would actually be a good like test to compare to. Just and I think that they had a really amazing. Uh, project and what ended up happening they got sued by the board of elections that they wouldn't want them inside. Oh. Uh, so I wouldn't want to, yeah, I don't want us to use, to compare those programs. I think that even Moya's initial methodology, there was, like, they were going after, like, some of the hardest, uh, some of the heaviest language barrier uh, poll sites, right? But then it still excludes some other communities. So it wasn't in, it, not every poll site uh, translator was out doing this? So they it, were, just, it, was they were moved, it was a pilot and it was done at uh, a number of different poll sites. Not all of them. Not all of them. Okay. And so then that wouldn't work. What I'm, what I'm suggesting wouldn't work. And even it would have, have to be pure data. Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it, and let's go to the next slide, actually. Um, which, and I wanted to mention again, and, and comparing Spanish to other languages, it wouldn't work for CEC because we're actually not allowed to serve, provide interpreters in any language, in any location that the DOE is working. So in our program, to I'll that, To that point, can we get a list of the BOE's uh, uh, servicing sites? Absolutely. Oh, in oh, our methodology. Oh, servicing actual whatever, services. Whatever services that we can just not even. Because they did by borough, but you want a little bit more of a drill down. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, we do know that uh, they're they're required to provide Spanish right. citywide, right. right? And then we, uh, in the document that we distributed last time, which is the proposed methodology, 
it tells you, and, and Doug has also read through these, like there are certain parts of the city where they're serving in other languages, but we, I don't know that, Moya, do we have a list of actual poll sites where it's located? Uh, no, we don't okay. have that. The VOE hasn't provided. Yeah. And also to note on the administrative data piece, the CDC will start to include administrative data, um, which includes utilization three after three election cycles to compare. Okay, so this the first step of this methodology, um, it was really to begin um, with, as the charter tells us, the designated city languages. And as I just mentioned, Spanish is a designated citywide language because so many people speak Spanish in the city, but we're not including it in this um, analysis in our methodology because BOE is required again to serve Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, other languages that are served by the, by the BOE, uh, such as Korean, Chinese, um, it, Urdu, Bengali, up there, they are included only in the locations where BOE is not working because we don't want to duplicate anything that's already happening. Um, we are also, the charter also specified that we should look to see whether there are any languages that are um, greater in number of limited English proficient speakers than. Um, the designated citywide languages, right? So you could imagine as the data change, populations change, um, you know, maybe there's people are speaking a language and it's higher than the lowest. Um, so we can, we are allowed to include those languages. Um, so the table here tells you the language and whether they're just a designated citywide language or not. And as you see, all of them are except for Yiddish. Um, and we're including Yiddish because it's the frequency of people who speak Yiddish is greater than the lowest um, designated citywide language. So the number here, there's a total number of limited English proficient New Yorkers that is shown in the right side column. Okay? And you might look at Korean and say, oh, why is that number so low? But just as a reminder, it's because it's excluding the people who are being served in other in the boroughs where BOE is operating. So that would exclude Queens. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's that's step one. So what are the eligible languages? What do, what do their numbers look like? How many people speak these languages across the city? <laughs> step two is um, determine the number of people who are citizens voting age. So the first table is just limited English proficient, no matter like what you're age. Now we want to narrow down on citizen voting age population who is limited English proficient for each language. So this table tells you, and you'll see like it's a smaller group of people speaking each language. Um, citizen voting age is 18 and above. And we talked about limited English proficiency, anyone who doesn't speak English very well and speaks another language. Um, you have any, does anyone have any questions on this slide? Good. Okay, table of uh, step three here is now that we know how many citizen voting age people there are who are limited English proficient in these languages that are program eligible, we want to know how many poll sites we want to serve for each of these languages. Now this goes back to the question of, you know, limit one, limited resources, but also there's many different ways that we can conceptualize this, right? Um, you could, for example, um, if we didn't have the requirement to serve just designated citywide languages, you could just pick the most frequently spoken language that is not served by the RA and serve only those full sites. That's another. That's one way to do. It. Um, what we try to do in, in proposing this approach is to try um, one. We want it to be consistent with the city's methodology of or sorry, the city's um, designated citywide languages. There are 10 languages that are spoken um, frequently in the city, and we wanted to try to be um, consistent with what the city's already doing, try providing translation in those languages. We want to try 
try to be inclusive, try to serve as many languages as possible, um, and then also address <coughs> needs. And so this methodology um, is really focusing on bringing those things together, consistency, inclusivity, and need, and it takes a proportionality approach. So it's looking at how what proportion <coughs> of the total number of people who are eligible speak Russian, for example. So if we know that 42%, hypothetically, um, of the total number of citizens voting age women and English people speak Russian, then if we had resources that were, um, that allowed us to provide interpretation at 100 sites, we would take 42 of those sites and give them Russian interpretation. So every language is allotted a proportion that reflects how it's represented in the greater whole. Um, does anyone have any questions on this or comments on, on how we're approaching this? The, but I understand where we are so far. Does the analysis then go on to help identify so 42% under your hypothetical, 42% of language access will be in the Russian language. <coughs> How do we determine which whole sites since we get to 100%? That's a next step. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, step four. Choose a specific whole sites to provide services for each program language. Um, so this gets into using the voter registration data, right? Like, we, and the BOE data. We need to know where the poll sites are located. So far, we've just been looking at, you know, who's speaking what language. Um, so we want to determine the citizen voting, citizen voting age, limited English proficient concentration in the area surrounding all the poll sites in the city. Right, we want to know what languages are being spoken in these poll sites areas. Um, we are going to then rank order the poll sites from the highest to lowest concentration for each language. So for Russian, we would go from the highest to the lowest rating. And you'll see some graph pictures of this in a little bit. In a little bit. Um, then we would look at that list from highest to lowest concentration and choose um, poll sites with the highest concentration down, moving down that list, until we get to the proportional allotment. So until we pick, when we get to 42 sites, we'll stop for Russian. But what if what yeah. number 40 through, or even 38 through 42 have like four people? Excellent point. Um, if there are fewer poll sites with significant, that's step D, with significant concentrations then allocated for a given language, we would consider allocating those translation resources to a different language. Thank you. So it allows for that flexibility, yeah. you know, to see what's happening on the ground and make adjustments. But in principle, again, trying to serve as many languages as possible, proportional to the need for that language. Right. And we would we would aim to provide interpretation services in at least one whole site in every language. Yeah. Uh, that's important. Yeah. Very important because it could well be that all the Russian speakers are in right speech, whereas the exactly. French speakers we'll, are we'll confused see across a lot of yeah. We will yeah, see I like, I like visuals. Yeah. So <laughs> next for the visuals, we have we do have some visuals. Is there a way to make this picture a little bigger? Mm -hmm. I think I don't know if there's a way to project it. I think the next slide is closer. Oh yes, you'll see it closer. Ashley, would you like to come up and talk us through this? Oh, wait, do you want the the for the span view or like the close up view? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's New York City. Uh, yes. <laughs> Lighting issue. Um, uh, can we turn off the lights so we can see a little better? I don't know if that affects the video, but. Try the switches above. There, there are switches above. There you go. Um, so I'm Asher Ross. I'm with the New York Affairs Unit, um, and I did a lot of this analysis. I just wanted to 
explain in a little more detail uh, this, this step four that Sarah's been describing. Um, she talks about how you know, one of the steps is to take the tract level data and then use it to determine concentrations of the LEP population by language in the areas surrounding each pole site in the city. Um, so I think a visual can help, uh, under help you understand how that was done. Um, so we mentioned that the, the most granular data on the LEP population is the ACS five-year data by census tract. Um, so when you map one of the languages, the LEP population for Russian, for example, that's a variable in the ACS tract data, and you map the concentration of that population, it looks like this. And the apologies for the outline of the city not being clear, but you know you can see Kew Gardens up here and Brighton Beach down there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so then what we then do is there's a pretty complex technical process to estimate that track data at the pole site catchment area level. I think you can show this in the little post on the next slide, right? Yeah. So yeah, here's when we zoom in to one area, you can see a little clearer. You know, this ECS track data gives us um, a way of mapping the distribution of Russian LEP. Um, and then the next step, since um, poll sites, um, people, you know, where you vote isn't based on your tract, it's based on election districts, it's a totally different geography. So we need to overlay this data with the poll site area boundaries. And when you do that, um, basically these blue polygons are the pole site area boundaries. Um, and what this is showing, yeah, so this is to zoom in. What this is showing you is if we've done the citywide global analysis and shown that, you know, Russian um, LEP is 42% of the total language asserts LEP population, 42%. In this hypothetical scenario, we're allocating 100 pull sites, or allocating in translation to 100 pull sites, doing it proportionally. That means 42 Russian pull sites. If you were to rank order the pull sites and take the top 42, it would be these pull sites, plus the ones that were like shown back up in Kew Gardens, et cetera, et cetera. But this close up shows what that basically looks like, and I think you can see um, how. In the analysis, we end up with a selection of poll sites that does align with the concentrations that um, the census ACS track data lets us uh, map. So yeah, this would be the targeted poll sites, and as someone mentioned, if one of these, for example, that made it into, it was like number 41 or number 42 on the list, like pretending that maybe, let's say this one, just made it in the list, but actually it turns out there's only 50 Russian LEP, but in some other place there's like, so that allows us with flexibility in, in part B of step four to drop that pull site if it doesn't meet a certain threshold. Um, and then sort of take that away from the 42 and give that one to another one which is less represented that does meet the threshold. So um, if anyone has questions for me, um, about this process. I just want to be clear again. So. Can you do the lights again? Yeah. Oh, sorry, before you ask, can I just see, is, is Carol Garza here? <coughs> Who? Carol from uh, Harlem Media Institute, is that you? Yes. Okay, great. Because uh, we had you down for public comment, um, so I just want to make sure that we oh, okay. in include you. And so, yeah, go ahead, <laughs> Chuck. Sure. Sorry. I, I just want to be clear at the end, we're using language efficiency, LEP, of voting age, but not registered voters. That's correct, because, you know. I still have a problem with that, because I think that we're overshooting and not focusing <coughs> on, on really what the data of who will show up at the poll site. And at that point, we're going to see huge inefficiencies. Yeah, I mean, we're trying to cope the best we can with two data sets that are each missing. So I still say, why wouldn't you cross it against the voter registration law? Once you have your, your LEP, why would you sort that against registered voters? So we're doing that in the sense that to get from tracts to poll site areas, if a tract sort of crosses a poll site area, we'll allocate, and I think there's a document that shows the more detailed methodology, 
will allocate the LEP track number to the different poll sites based on the voter surname data. And that's where you know that voter surname data buttresses the steps that we took to get to this point with ACS data. Yeah, because right. the surname data is an indicator of the language you speak. Right. Once we once we include that yeah. type of analysis. But to Sabrina's point, um, <laughs> you can't like cross these two data sets, quote unquote, because the census ACS data is anonymized. I'm sorry, what does that mean? Anonymous. Anonymous. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 And it no, doesn't tell us that form. <laughs> It's anonymized okay. and it doesn't tell us about the voter registration status, but the voter data isn't anonymized, but it doesn't tell us about language. Could we, I mean, let's just say that, uh, is that Brighton Beach, which is showing up with several polling sites, very red. Um, can we, do we know from the Board of Elections that we have higher voter concentration, at least in that area, to understand that we're cross-checking data on some level. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that we can use that surname data to sort of be another check on the, the threshold, you know? And like also, I think as other people have suggested, we can hopefully use more like surveying of what the translation services that are actually used on election day are to enhance this analysis. But um, I think you would end up with a similar result. But you know, we would need to see how that plays out and, and get the data from <coughs> the election day data. There's also no perfect data sure. set to yeah. go to. Sure. Just put yeah. that out there. Because the ACS data is not perfect. And yeah. you know, I don't know, I've never received one. Williams never received one, no. I heard say earlier. I think even folks who do receive it who then have who feel an obligation to submit the survey back may not be filling it out themselves, yeah. and that information may not be accurate. So I think, for me, the LEP data is more important and trying to figure out how we structure this program mm -hmm. because it's going to give us a truer uh, need than others. Like, for instance, I occasionally do voter protection efforts during elections. The last two elections that have happened, I can tell you that who were showing up to vote in Brighton Beach, Manhattan Beach, were Russian-speaking voters. And some of them had translators with, translators with them, some of them were confused about what the process was. Like, it was a very, uh, very interesting experience, but I do think that when I see this map, I see the area. And where the darkest red is, where the biggest issue. Is there a way to work more with BOE to get them to buttress the data as far as, I don't know on a new registration, do they ask if you need assistance in another language? They, don't. And they do not. Oh, no. So, I mean, wouldn't that be something that would be some tremendously helpful or even the existing voter will to ask if you need services? Being, you know, because then you have the vote saying, I need help in such and such language. That's right. That, that would be a deal, but I think they may, that may require some either um, executive policy change or maybe even legislative change. I'm not mm -hmm. sure because the form, I mean, to the make a change to the form. which you register? Yes. Yeah. Any changes to the form will require either executive okay. policy change mm -hmm. coming from the top or legislative change. I'm from not the sure. state, yeah. I think it might be that this body should work, be recommending that to well, better serve, be right. to better serve the constituents that we're trying to serve. And right uh, now in the state just, of New York, we're, we're looking at automatic Yes, so it's a good, it's a good time so to, to make a bet. bet. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're basically saying to someone you need help, and that would help us help them. Other aid, other agencies that provide services that try to capture all the data to provide. Do we service. do we know anything about this, Moya? Whether BOE asks uh, or could potentially be interested in asking a question about whether people need interpretation services. On voter registration forms? Can Any comment on, on that? Yeah. No, I mean, I think it's something to ask the OE. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and I, having worked with them, I do not think that they'd be interested. And to be <laughs> frank, <laughs> the city, specifically Moya, the mayor's office of immigrant affairs, translated voter registration form into like 15 or 16 languages. Mm -hmm. 
on their own because they wouldn't do it. So I was just giving you guys the kind of example of Yeah, I don't know. I think that there's a lot of uh, laws that constrict what they can do and they try to be as do as little as possible as opposed to as expansive as possible in the work that they do. So I wouldn't be too optimistic that BOE is like waiting for us to give them a recommendation of how to make voting easier because they definitely don't do anything. Yes, we can go back to our earlier conversation about community boards with the BOE. Yeah. It's it's split evenly half of each party, so half Democrats, half Republicans. It's a it's a body that has a cultural history. So um, there we are again. I mean, I think I think we want to remember it before I turn it over to Carol. i ask her to do her. Well, tell us more about herself and her group. Um, we are trying to add value to what's happening. We're trying to address gaps that are, you know, that exist from, you know, various initiatives that people have been trying to reach communities for. So it's, I um, just want to say again, I'm truly honored and humbled to be with you all trying to stand this thing up, right? It's very exciting and hopefully we will have measurable outcomes <coughs> Point two, where we've actually made a difference. Um, I'm a great believer in putting drops in a bucket, and I think drops in a bucket matter. So we might not see, like, I would love to see a huge impact, but I think I would be very grateful to see small and substantial impacts as well in all of the program lanes that we're working in. And I think we just need to, we're trying to pay, pay attention also to evaluation and how we track this work, right? And so we can know that we, we've made a difference, which we hope to do. Um, so we want to work with you. This is a crucial point that I want to make before we turn to the next step, the, the test of the public comment. We need to work together to make sure that we have people showing up to the public hearing who are offering testimony on this methodology, who care to come and listen to the testimony. So. I'm going to be reaching out to you individually um, and as a group to help with that. So please look out for our email and please uh, be responsive. We don't have that much time between now and February 18th. This is our first <coughs> public hearing. We want to make sure that we have a public to interact with at the public hearing. So thank you, um, everyone. So Carol, would you like to come up and share some of your are you going to be speaking with us? No, actually this is my first time attending oh. this meeting and so I learned about um, civic engagement com uh, commission through for Manhattan President Gail Brewer's office. Okay. And I have a nonprofit called Harlem Media Institute. Yeah. Do you want to come up to the mic and just tell us about your nonprofit? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you guys hear me? <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> so the website for my uh, nonprofit is um, www.harlemediainstitute.org, and um, it is a um, research think tank, intergenerational um, uh, cultural think tank. It's a nonprofit, and. The premise, the mission of Harlem Media is to address the acute gentrification issues that are happening in Harlem, as well as the meteoric technology um, uh, developments that are posing a disadvantage to um, legacy residents in Harlem. And so, it's, and it's community-based driven, as well as a research think tank. So when I learned about this commission, I thought, oh, I want to know what's going on, and so I, I'm here today to just be uh, an observer and to find out how I can become involved with the commission and participate and take the information and knowledge that I'm learning back to Carla and uh, use it to support my nonprofit. Thank you. You're very welcome. Any thank questions? You for, for thank you for acknowledging me. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Any questions for Carol? Well, I have one. You always have questions. 
Uh, sorry, I was late. I <coughs> another meeting. Carol, um, yes. your organization is it, 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 a great organization. I've not known that much about it. Um, but my, my question to you is the technology desert that is Harlem right now. Yes. Um, and all the people that are moving into gentrification and all of that. Do you see that it will remain that way, or do we need to work on it to, to change it? Because Silicon Harlem is trying to change that. Yes, they, I they know. just got because I mean, okay, I'm from Harlem. Full disclosure. So, um, so we're trying to work with that. Um, so my question is, are you working with other groups? in the area, and is it Central Harlem, is it East Harlem, is it West Harlem? Because there's a difference, even culturally, yes. in, in the Harlem, it's not just Harlem um, uh, as one uh, body. So that's, that's just, if you understand the Yes, question. I do. Okay. That's a great question, thank you for asking. Uh, yes, there is a technical technology desert in Harlem, and I do know about um, silicon. Harlem. And Harlem Media is new, so I'm getting to know the different organizations, nonprofits, church leaders, um, other folks in the community who are um, doing things to um, bring people together in Harlem because we know that there's a divide there. So um, Harlem Media's mission is to cover all of Harlem from the south to the north, from the east to the west, because we are all one. So um, any information that you can provide for me, and I would love to just speak to you post this uh, mm -hmm. meeting, I would be very um, thankful to acquire from you. And yes, we're, we're all working together. And that's the question that I'm trying to do understand myself as Harlem Media is getting off the ground and meeting with uh, different leaders from these uh, businesses and organizations. How are we going to close that gap? I mean, you as well, right? You're in Mark. Yeah. Harlem is ish area, upper west. <laughs> <laughs> like more Harlem ish. And more Harlem ish. Uh, the more ish. ish. Community school district. Three includes a portion of Southern Harlem, and even though my community board district stops at 110, if you want to be involved in a school district, you need to embrace the entirety of the school district. So I find myself up there. And the one thought that I did have for folks to whom you might make yourself known, um, the the link between um, resisting gentrification uh, and education may be a little bit attenuated, but it is the case that the six schools in the southern part of Harlem, Central Harlem, uh, which are in District 3, mm -hmm. are chronically under-enrolled and uh, a, a frequent uh, target for co-locations with other kinds of schools, all kinds of schools. Uh, I know that's a whole other conversation. Um, but it's also the case that uh, Harlem residents in that area in particular tend not to, more than half of them tend to send their children to schools elsewhere. And the connection that I see, and you'll probably see a much deeper one, um, the one, the connection I see is that using your community schools and reinforcing them is a way to maintain the integrity of the legacy community. Interestingly enough, when they tried to close Wadley wow. Middle School, the community did find gel around that effort, uh, or the resistance to that effort, I should say. So um, there is something called the Harlem Schools Summit. I believe this year it's on May 16th. Oh, okay. um, and I think it's at PS 76 on 122nd Street. Um, that is something that you might want to put in your calendar um, as, um, yep, May, uh, May 16th at 76. Um, the lead presenter will be my brother's keeper. Um, and these are organizations that might have affinity for the message that I understand you to be conveying. Okay. Um, we have just a... Thank you so much.
so much. Um, <coughs> we have just a few minutes left, so I want to just take you very quickly through the milestones we need to hit in the next few months, which is your last slide in the PowerPoint. Um, we, we touched on publishing the methodology, which went up January 1. Um, we did translate the executive summary into the 10 languages, and we'll be circulating um, those as well, possibly trying to get them printed in different no. The public comment is now open between Jan 1 through March 1. For the people you know, even if they can't show up to the hearing, they can post and send us public comments, and so please do encourage people to write. Now this is an opportunity, I believe, to talk about the full site methodology, but it's also a chance for communities to talk about their language needs. Mm -hmm. Right, so if we think about it broadly, I think there's a lot of people who'd like to tell the city about the language barriers that they're facing, particularly on election day, um, and also respond to what we propose in the methodology. So I think there's different ways that we can get people to pay closer attention to what we're doing. So after March 1, we have a revision period for the proposed methodology till March 31st, and then the public here, um, sorry, we need to post the final April 1, uh, 2020. What is not noted here, but which is very important, is that we as a commission need to vote on the final methodology that will be posted on April 1. So sometime in late March, we will need to come together and vote on that before it gets posted, okay? We're gonna start working on taking in public input. We haven't actually received a public comment yet. Um, and I think part of it is that we have to do, we need to just get out there with this and share this with people. Um, so, and, and really try to get more people to engage with it. But um, we can revise the methodology from now until whenever we're ready to present to you. But I just wanted to flag for you that the March meeting is gonna be very critical and then the February um, meeting is our public hearing, February 18th. So, sorry, we have, um, I don't know that we have set the date for March, but I know a poll went out, you know, but we'll, we'll make sure that we get that. March is very busy, can we, like, get on it? I know yes. For well, me, I'm talking about there's a budget, so. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can we just understand, is the public meeting going to be uh, going through the slides like this? Um, most of it will be dedicated to hearing from the people who are there, but we are going to provide a quick overview, just so people know. Yeah, because yeah. I, I mean, this sitting through this, I think for the general public would be excruciating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's just look, it's too much to take in. All for like the hearing. Yeah. Yeah. So thinking of the presentation that we're going to give. Of her. If we really want to listen to what they have to say, I think it's we more should important. somehow give them a summary prior to coming almost. Yeah, I mean, we're assuming you that know? the people that will come will have read this and have this some entire thing. about it. Yeah. I think we can still, it's like a three hour meeting. You can do like a 10 to 15 minute. Yeah. 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 Just to explain, go through like yes. highlights. Similarly, yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. So, um, it's not about the population, it's just we all know. Maybe it was excruciating for you. <laughs> no, 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 but this is a lot to take in. It was very complicated. So I just, you know, I know with my own community, they would be like, <laughs> I'm out of here. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a tough part of all of this, right? Like we're trying to use data that is um, sound and have neutral criteria and <coughs> create a, a framework for how we do this and then, then make it accessible to, to everyday workers, even to ourselves, as, you know, because if, once you start talking about data, it's something that... Well, I think the thing is, is the public will say, what about me? Right. Am I am I represented here? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's important to have whoever is in the room with the data to be able to say, yes, you are represented, and here's how, or yeah. no, you're not, and we need to understand why. Yeah. I think that's the, the critical that's point of this. Great point, so we can be prepared to answer everyone, even if even those that speak a language that might not be part of the um, of this. Analysis. Yes, yes, we, we will. We will and translation services will be provided at this meeting. 
Yes, we are providing <laughs> translation services. That would be helpful. <laughs> yes, we are providing <laughs> translation services. <laughs> yeah. Just and I think, sure. I think that's that's also an opportunity again to let people know of their rights. Like if yes. if they're not if their language isn't included in this, they have the right to register. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to now call, call the meeting to uh, uh, end. Do I hear a motion to adjourn the meeting? Point of order. You have a quorum. Do you want to take your yeah. Yeah. We already voted. Oh, sorry. Well, you, I think you're in the master. I apologize. Yes. <laughs> I'm fine. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, we did vote on the meeting. Yeah, that's fine. Uh -huh. okay. Would Two. anyone like to uh, make a motion? I make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. Okay. Great. Um, motion has been seconded. Is um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Great. Meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.